All right, well, good to see everyone here and uh, some new faces as well. And I had one of those full circle moments this week. It was interesting. My son was playing in a basketball tournament, and at his, his high school was playing in this tournament at my old high school. And so it was fun to watch him play, and uh, it was like a full circle moment. I had played on the same court, and he was playing on the court. And then in walked my coach, who I had been, who had coached me in basketball years ago. I won't say how many. And... Uh, he told me something interesting. Here's watching my son. He's, he's talking to me. And then I said, Coach, how, how long have you been here? He says, this is my 52nd year teaching. Now, I don't know about you. Have any, I know there's some teachers out here, but 52 years seems like a lot of time to teach in the same school. And uh, he said he was 20 years old when he started at the school. And now I guess he's 70. Wow, 72 if I do the math properly. So that's amazing. And uh, it, was, it was a special moment. God does allow us to have these moments, doesn't he, in, uh, in our life as we go through moments of interaction with people, moments of blessing, and, uh, and, and for those of us who, who may not have much family here, uh, God gives us a spiritual family, and he provides for these connections with one another. The Bible says that, that we are to not just believe, but belong. We not just believe in the Lord Jesus, but we are to belong, and we belong, when we believe, we belong to the body of Christ. And God wants us to uh, connect with his church, his body. Now, if you're new here, I'm going through the book of Jonah. And today is the last message in a five-part series on it. And uh, just to kind of put up a few things here and uh, just kind of orient ourselves before we get into the chapter, the last chapter, actually, of this series. And uh, thank, thank, I'm thankful for Adrian, who had, had prepared these, these, the next four slides for me. Um, they're also the thumbnails on YouTube. So in chapter 1, we saw Jonah running from God. God told him to go to Nineveh, and uh, Nineveh was uh, east. Jonah went the opposite direction on a ship. He went west, and uh, it caused all kinds of problems. And you know what? That's the truth, isn't it? When we run from God, when we do our own thing, doesn't it cause all kinds of problems for us? We can't outrun God. We can't run away from God. And Jonah learned that, and, and he learned it the hard way. And, he, and God sent this storm to get his attention. And then when the sailors in the ship learned that Jonah was running from God, and Jonah asked to be thrown into the water, and incredibly, they did. They threw him overboard, and immediately the storm subsided. And interestingly, the sailors, who were Gentiles, turned to worship the Lord in God's grace. Now God sent this huge fish to rescue Jonah. Chapter 2, we see Jonah praying to God. I mean, this is, this is a, he's been running from God, and the, and the first time the book of Jonah, he starts praying in chapter 2. Sometimes we have to be flat on our face and in trouble before we look up. Of course, God doesn't want a prayer to be a last resort. He wants it to be a first resort. But Jonah started praying. He get right with God. He, after three days and three nights in the fish's belly, and by the way, this fish was sent by God to rescue him, uh, not to harm him, obviously. Because it was the means of his salvation. In chapter 2, Jonah cries out uh, that the Lord, salvation comes from the Lord. And I think he meant that quite literally and physically, but he also meant it spiritually. Salvation comes from the Lord. Then in chapter 3, it was a, a, a chapter we saw a few weeks ago that we, Jonah gets a second chance. God sends him to, he goes to Nineveh now and he obeys God. And as a result, uh, the people there believe. It's one of the greatest revivals that, that, that has ever happened, actually. Because it says in, in Jonah 3 that all the people from Nineveh, from young to old, including the king, are now believers in the Lord. And so this is, this is just an amazing uh, chapter. What a happy ending. Now, I, I, as a kid, when I heard the story of Jonah, um, I thought it ended here. In fact, that's usually what you get in Sunday school. You get, you know, the happy ending. But it, the natural fact, there's, this is not the end. There's, there's another chapter. And the next chapter is a bizarre twist. And because it seems like Jonah should just be, you know, so happy. Jonah should be doing backflips with excitement. There's this great revival. But what's Jonah doing? He's sulking. He's angry. He's upset. And so this is what chapter 4 is all about. We see Jonah arguing with God. Is it a, is it a good idea to argue with God? Well, not really. I mean, God, we, we can try. We can complain. We can argue. But, but ultimately, God, God knows what's best for us. And 
So this is where we, instead of being happy, Jonah's angry. And it's a very bizarre twist in this story. Let's pray as we begin this chapter. Lord God, I just ask as in prayer that as we look at your word together, Lord, you know the needs of every person here, every person watching, everyone who will see this message. And, and I believe that, that you, you brought us here for a reason, that you, you want to teach us some very important lessons from your word today. And so, God, I pray that you, you would be our teacher. Um, and then I, I wouldn't get in the way of what, what you want to say to each person. And I ask that uh, we would just have open hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'm excited because this chapter is a strange one, but it is also uh, some powerful lessons for us. It begins like this, and I just invite you to open up your Bible if you have one, or take a look at the Pew Bibles there. They're blue, if it would help you. Uh, I'll put some of the verses on the screen, but not all of them, but at least we'll get going. And this is how Jonah chapter 4 begins. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. What seemed wrong? Well, the fact that the Ninevites, Ninevites repented and God didn't destroy the city like he had said he would if they didn't repent. And so Jonah's angry. Why is he angry? Well, the next verse gives us some answers. And if you were here in the first uh, message of this series, you remember we looked at this verse, but Jonah says, he said, he prayed to the Lord. He said, isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's in a very dark place. I mean, it's so dark, he, he, he wants to end his life. You'd think he would be happy and excited that he's just been used, God has used him to, you know, see an incredible revival. You'd think he'd be happy, but he isn't. What is going on? Well, Jonah's saying some very interesting things here. The reason he's so upset, according to verse 2, is that he knew that God would forgive the Ninevites if they repented, and Jonah didn't want that to happen. It's hard for us to, to fathom why Jonah didn't want that to happen, because as far as Jonah was concerned, it was like he was okay if God judged them and sent them to hell. That's why he headed west when God said to go east. He didn't want them to see, see them spared from judgment. He didn't like the Ninevites. And they were like, and, and it's hard for us to understand because in Jonah's day, the Ninevites were like the number one enemy, okay? Assyrian Empire, capital Nineveh, they were, they were the strongest world superpower, and they were, they, were, they were destroying everyone as they took over. And they were known to be especially brutal and violent, and, and no wonder Jonah was scared of them, but Jonah and the Israelites also really hated them. And so that's what Jonah was saying. He's saying that's why he didn't go when God told him to go. Because it's like God was saying, I want you to go. I mean, imagine God said to you, think of the person that maybe you find the hardest to get along with. Or maybe the person that's caused you the most pain, the most frustration, the most difficult. And God says, I want you to go and love them and take care of them and tell them my good news. The person that you least want to be with, and God says, go be with them. Well, that just gives us a little bit of an idea, maybe, what Jonah was facing. But Jonah, we know, as from the story, he, he resisted this. He resisted this. And even when he saw them turn to the Lord, his heart was not happy. He was still in a dark place. It's sort of like, you know, God, he knew that God was gracious. But here's the thing. He didn't think God's grace should be given to them. Do you have any people like that? You know, do you see the irony of Jonah's attitude? It's like Jonah was fine when he got God's grace, but he couldn't handle it when God showed that grace to the people of Nineveh. Double standard, right? Double standard. And, and, and before we're too quick to point the finger at Jonah, I, I think sometimes we're guilty of that same double standard. 
You know, like we talk about God's forgiveness. God forgives all who come to him. And, and God wants us to forgive. But then we secretly hold a grudge against somebody. Or we talk about God's love, God's love, God's love. But then we just lose our temper with the people that we should be loving. Or, you know, or we talk about God's peace, God's peace. And then we get full of anxiety as we try and handle everything on our own. We were kind of inconsistent too. Before we point the finger just at Jonah, I think we often should look at ourselves first. And I think it's easy to point a finger at Jonah, but maybe that's exactly the danger. Maybe that's the danger. You see, remember how much Jonah's, Jonah had received grace? I mean, each chapter, right? You could list three or four things. In the first chapter, uh, God was so gracious. Even though he ran away from God, God didn't just dismiss him. God came and pursued him and showed grace and wanted him to, not, uh, to continue to, to, to come back to him. He sent this fish to swallow him, not to harm him and destroy him, but to save him. And then in chapter 2, he, sent, he showed grace by answering Jonah's prayers. And then chapter 3, he showed grace by uh, giving him a second chance and, and leading, using Jonah to lead this revival. You see, each chapter, there's so many examples of God's grace. But then the minute the Ninevites received God's grace, Jonah took an issue. I mean, he had received so much grace himself, but it's like he couldn't handle seeing others blessed. And again... I wonder if sometimes we're the same way. We say, God, bless me. God, help me. God, do this for me. And then maybe he does, or maybe he doesn't. But then we look at someone else, and we see God blessing them, or something good going on in their life, and we can't be happy for them. We can't rejoice with them. Because something's going on in our hearts. And the real issue, see, the real issue that Jonah had was not with the Ninevites. It was with God. It was with God. And I think the key to understanding the story of Jonah, I'll just put up something here, maybe just helps. The key to understanding this story is to see that there's actually two interconnected stories going on at the same time. They're running in parallel. You see, there's one is God's dealings with Nineveh, but the other is God's dealings with Jonah. And I hope that in this series, I've helped you see that because you could look at this story of uh, Jonah as just a story about God's dealings with Nineveh, but that would be only half of the story. There's another story going on, and that's God's dealings with Jonah. And unless you see those both together, this book won't make sense in the same way that God wants it to make sense for us. Now, how did God deal with Nineveh? He had dealt with them in grace. Though they deserved judgment, God spared them from judgment because they turned to him in repentance. And God is the same with us, right? If we turn to Jesus Christ... We turn in repentance and faith to Jesus. What does God do? God says in Romans 8, this tells us the gospel. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I was talking to someone this week who was, who was struggling a little bit with, with the idea of, of, of you know, their sin and, and, and how does God feel about that sin. I said, well, if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you're in Christ Jesus, he's in you, you're in him, then guess what? Like this verse says, there's no condemnation for you. God will not condemn you for that sin because Jesus took the sin upon him when he died on the cross. He paid the price. He took God's judgment upon him, and so you don't have to bear it. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's something we should never get tired of reflecting on. We're spared from God's judgment, just like the Ninevites were. But you see, God isn't just dealing with Nineveh here. He's also dealing with Jonah. Now, here's the question. How does God deal with Jonah? Well, he deals with Jonah in grace, doesn't he? At each turn, turst and turn, he deals in grace. But, but now, how does God deal with Jonah in chapter 4? Jonah's now kind of a little bit smug. He's a little bit uh, arrogant. He's maybe hypocritical and self-righteous. How does God deal with that kind of person? Well, let's keep reading, okay? Let's keep going. Jonah 4 and verse 4 says, But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? I love how God just ans- asks questions sometimes. Right? Jesus did that a lot too, right? When he interacted with people, he asked questions to kind of get them to be drawn in and draw out what was going on in their heart. 
And so God just asked this question, you know, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Now, we know the answer, but the answer was meant to draw Jonah out. Obviously, it isn't right for Jonah to be angry, but hopefully Jonah will come to that conclusion it's himself. You know, you know when you, someone else, you know what's needed in a certain situation, or you know what somebody needs, but they don't see it? And that can be frustrating, right? But the, the, often the way to help them is not to, to tell them what they need to do or tell them how they should be, but to ask questions. Don't you think this could be a little bit better doing it this way compared to this way? Help them just to see them, and that's what God is trying to do here. He's not playing a heavy-handed, though he can. He's trying to be graceful and encouraging and patient. Look at the next verse. It says, Jonah had gone out. So after this whole revival, Jonah's now gone out and he sat down at a place east of the city. So he's outside the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Why is Jonah doing this? Well, Jonah now leaves Nineveh. He's outside the city walls. What's he hoping that God is going to do? You remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? I think Jonah is hoping that God is still going to rain uh, fire and brimstone and judgment on Nineveh just like he did back with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he's, he's separating himself, right? He's distancing himself so he's okay as he waits and watch God's judgment to fall. But we know God's decided not to bring judgment. He has other plans. He's not going to destroy the city like Jonah would like him to do. Jonah's waiting. What's going on here? Jonah's waiting for God to deal with them over there. But God is interested in dealing with Jonah in here. Like Jonah is so focused on what's going on out there that it's like he's lost track of what's going on in here, in his heart. And again, as I'm thinking about, as I was preparing the sermon, I was thinking, I can be like that too. You know? Like, it's like we could look at what's going on in Israel right now and say, man, I can't believe how terrible it is and the violence and the hate. And, and yes, there's a lot of terrible things but maybe if we look a little more at ourselves, we also have to realize there's some conflicts going on in here sometimes. Or there's some conflicts with our neighbor, with our, a family member, and, and God, God doesn't want us, yes, we pray for that, but God wants us to deal with this. And so, Jonah, it's like he's so fixated. I think the words of Jesus would be a good appropriate for Jonah to hear at this moment. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7. 7 verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? The plank that Jesus is referring to, of course, is the sin of self-righteousness. It could be any sin, really, but when you're self-righteous, you can't really evaluate your brother's condition because you've got your own plank in your eye that hinders you from looking at a speck in your brother's eye. And Jesus, of course, goes on, right, in that same Teaching in verse 4 and 5 now, says, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see more clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see, God wants us to first look at ourselves. Before we say anything to anybody else, say, look at yourself Ask God, what are the things you want me to change? What are the things I need to change? What are the habits I need to stop? What are the good things, habits I need to start? And God, what, what are you speaking to me? What are the people you want me to forgive? What are the, you know, look, we need to look at ourselves. And the thing is, the thing that, 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 that can be a struggle in churches, I've been, I've been a pastor for, for uh, 20 years now as an ordained pastor, a little, a little uh, actually, a little, yeah, yeah, but 20 years. Uh, and one of the things that sometimes can happen in churches is, you know, a church can have speck hunters, okay? 
A spec hunter, that's, that's somebody who, who really is, is good at being critical of all the things going on, but, but, but they're allergic to examining their own life. And every church has their spec hunters. Every church I think I've been in has their, church, has their spec hunters. But here's the thing. If you're, if you're set on finding things that are wrong uh, about church, you're going to find them. You're going to find them. You know, it's like the old joke, you know, you're looking for a church, you're looking for a perfect church, well, don't, if you find the perfect church, guess what? It's spoiled because you're there, <laughs> right? We all bring our baggage into whatever place of worship we may choose. But here's the thing, if you're set on finding something wrong with the church, you'll find something wrong. You know, if you look long enough, hard enough, you'll see something wrong with the worship. You'll see something wrong with the preacher. You'll see something wrong with the, the leaders. It, it's easy to be critical. But in the process of being critical, here's the problem. You may miss out on God's grace. You may miss out on God's grace. How so? Because, you see, when we're hypercritical, we miss out on what God is wanting to do in our life. Because we're so busy trying to point out the speck in other people's eyes. And I think that's what's going on with Jonah. I think that's what's going on with Jonah. Look, look what happens next. God now uh, does some interesting things here. It says in verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give a shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Isn't God so gracious to Jonah? I mean, he's sulky, he's angry, he's arguing, he's bitter, he's in bad temper, bad mood. And God's like, I'm still taking care of you, Jonah. But God does something interesting. So at first he does something helpful. Jonah was very happy about the plant. Verse 7 though. But at dawn the next day God provided a worm. Oh. Which chewed and the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose up, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And said it would be better for me to die than to live. So what's going on here? Well, I think what's going on is God is trying to orchestrate the circumstances in Jonah's immediate life to bring him to a place of repentance and restoration. And he's allowing, he, first he providing, notice the language of verse 6, the Lord provided. That's good. And then God provided a worm. That's bad. Then God provided this plant. You know, God was doing these things. And God often does things in our life, doesn't he? Provisions, but sometimes he takes things away, and that's hard. The Lord takes, the Lord takes away. And sometimes God does those things, why? To work on our hearts, to work in our lives. The same God that sent the plant to shade Jonah is the one who sent the worm and the wind to make Jonah uncomfortable. I want you to remember that. And it's an unco- it, may, it may be hard to think about God in that way, but you see what, again, God is all doing this in love. He's not trying to hurt Jonah. He's trying to help Jonah have a change in his attitude because that's what he needed. If we're looking for application lessons from this chapter, Jonah, one of them is that God wants us to have a good attitude towards others, an attitude of humility, of love, of empathy, and compassion. God wants us to have a good attitude. I heard the story about a, an elderly carpenter who, who worked his whole life uh, doing carpentry, and he was, he, was, he was good at it, actually, and he'd worked for this contractor, and the man was ready, this, this carpenter was ready to retire. So he told his boss his plans. And the boss was sad to hear the news, and he begged him. He's like, please just do one more project for me. Just one more house as a personal favor. And so the carpenter said, yes, I agree. But in his heart, he didn't really want to. But he said, I'll do it. And in time, as time went on, as he's building this house, his, you could tell his heart was in the work. He resorted to shoddy workmanship. He used inferior metals. He whined, uh, materials he whined. He complained about his boss. 
put no care into the furnishings, into the finishings. And when he finished his work, his boss came to look at the house. And the boss handed him the front door key to the new house and said, this is your house. It's my gift to you. The carpenter was speechless. If only he had known he was building his own house, he would have done it so much differently. You know, there's a lesson in there for us, isn't there? Each day we are building our life one moment at a time. And our attitude really does count and matter. Not only does it matter to the people around us, I can assure you of that, but our attitude matters most importantly to God. Philippians 2, this is a good verse at this point to consider. Do everything without grumbling and complaining so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them in the world like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Word of life. So rather than, you know, complain about the circumstances of life, even if it's hard. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a time to, to go to a trusted friend and say, hey, this is hard. I'm having a hard time. Pray for me. I need help. There's people that we need to do that with. But this is more talking about just our general attitude with others and everyone, I think. Rather than be complaining and negative, God wants us to be in fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, says what we are to do. It says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's a, a verse like this that, verses like this are verses that tell us what God's will is, right? You know, sometimes we wonder, what's God's will for my life? What is God wanting to do in me, through me? with me, what is his will, what is his plan, and, and we, we, but then verses like this tell us that, that aside from career and, and family and things, God is really concerned with just how we live our life, in a relationship with him, and in a relationship with others that is help, and, and, and look at, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, because some circumstances that happen to us, maybe somebody uh, sins against us and, and, and harms us, we're not necessary to give thanks for the sin that is caused to us. No, that would be wrong. What we are, though, however, to do is to learn to give thanks in the midst of it and say, God, I believe you're allowing this, even though it's painful and difficult, you're allowing it for a good purpose. And I believe that you're going to use this to, uh, to grow me, to mature me, even though it's painful, even though it's hard, even though I don't really like it right now, I trust you. I'm still thankful that the, the way that you take care of me, you provide for me, uh, and, and you're, in all things, you're going to work together for the good of, of me, because I love you. That's what it means to give thanks in all circumstances. It means to still find a way to come to God in a relationship of, of trust and dependency. And that's God's will for you. You can do that every, you can live in God's will every single day as you do that. Isn't that amazing? You can live in God's will every single day as you do these things. You see, so much of God's will for our life has to do with the way that we live it, the kind of people that we are in Christ. Not necessarily the, the job that we have at 9 to 5 or, or the, the career that we choose, though God does have a hand in that too. I've certainly seen that in my life. But God's will for us is often in how we live. Live out our faith in, your, in our day-to-day -day life. And so God's concerned about our attitude. That's what Jonah teaches us in this chapter. Now, the scary thing is we can sometimes do the right things even with the wrong attitude, right? Jonah did. I think Jonah went to, Jonah preached, did the right thing. He went to Nineveh, he preached, he did what God wanted, but he had the wrong attitude. And so 
maybe we can go to church, but we can go with the wrong attitude. Instead of humility and, and spirit of worship, we can go with pride and self-righteousness. And instead of going with an attitude of love and encouragement, we can go with this hypercritical lens. And, or we can even, sometimes, you know what, we can even read our Bibles with the wrong attitude. Like we read them just to check it off the list and say, see what, I good, see what good thing I did today. God wants us to read, our, read the word as a way to enjoy a relationship with him. Not just to check it off the list. I'm guilty of doing that sometimes, checking it off the list. But I know, see, God doesn't want that. God wants us to, to come to him and say, God, I want this relationship with you. I want to hear from you. And how do we hear from God? We read his word. We study his word. That's how he speaks to us. I was talking to, to someone this week about just the simple, uh, the way that we live our Christian life. And I said, you know, what do you do in a relationship with some, a friend or with a spouse or with a child? How do you have, what, what, are, what are the most important ingredients in that relationship? And they said, well, the most important thing is that I talk to them and I listen to them. I talk to them, I listen to them. That's how you have a relationship. I said, that's right. I said, now, now transfer that to God. How do you have a relationship with God? You talk to God, you listen to God. Talking to God is prayer. Listening to God is, is reading and studying his word and letting the word speak to you. That's how God talks to you. That's how you listen to him. Talk to him and listen to him. You need both. You need both. And that's, that's just a simple rhythm and routine that we need, but it's also a relationship that's what's important. See, God wants a relationship with you. That's what the gospel tells us, that, that God wants a relationship so much that he sent Jesus to, to, to deal with the biggest problem, which is the problem of our sin. And once that problem had been dealt with, Jesus rose again in victory, and now he invites us to just have this relationship with him that begins in faith, and, but then it continues in faith. Right? The same way that it starts, it continues. It says in Colossians. Now, God gets the last word, of course. God always gets the last word. What does God say in verse 9? We see this, this one little more conversation going on here between Jonah and God. Verse 9, But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry I wish I were dead. Jonah sounds like a little kid here. <laughs> but the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Right, the plant that sprung up, that caused him, she gave him shade. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. He's like, Jonah, why are you so upset about this little plant? You didn't even do anything about it. I provided for it. You're, you're, you're concerned about the wrong things, Jonah. What does God say? Verse 11, And should I have not concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which... There are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And also, many animals. Hmm. There's an interesting verse for pet lovers. God seems to be quite concerned about the animals that we have. Right? That we take care of those animals. Now, God gets this last word in the book. He has the first word. He has the last word. And his last word to Jonah is basically, Jonah, I love the people of Nineveh. Won't you? Jonah, I love the people of Nineveh. If I love the people of Nineveh, you need to love them too. If you claim to follow me. You see, up until this point, Jonah had been more concerned with his own well-being than with the well-being of the people of Nineveh. His heart was so self-absorbed that there wasn't any, any other room left for others. Actually, the problem's even worse. Not just is there no room in his heart for the people of Nineveh, Jonah has no room in his heart for a God who does. When verse 11 says that there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand, this is a verse that commentators are divided about the meaning of. <laughs> and <clears throat> what does it mean? Well, 
Some people believe it, it means that there were 120,000 people in the city because God makes a specific reference to 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. But then the question is, well, if there's 120,000 people in the, city, in the city, surely they can tell their right, surely the, the older ones can tell their right hand from their left hand. I mean, typically, children often cannot tell their right hand from their left hand, right? Those of you who have young, have young children or had children that one, one point were young, right? You're teaching them what their right hand is, what their left hand is. Sometimes they couldn't figure it out. So maybe there's 120,000 children in the city. You see how complicated it is? It's not clear exactly what God means. Um, or maybe God is talking about the fact that these are like spiritual infants who, who, who don't know right from wrong, who need to be taught, just like a child needs to be taught the left hand from the right hand. These are kids, spiritually speaking, who need the teaching of truth and the teaching of God's Word. That's also a very, very possible and likely meaning but whatever the meaning is, I don't think it's as important as the lesson that God is trying to say. I think God is trying to say, whether these are the infants he's talking about, whether it's the whole city, or whether it's just the people who are spiritually like infants, God is saying, I love them. And Jonah, will you love them too? Will you love them too? Let me ask you a question. I want to make this really personal because I think we need to let God's word go a little bit deeper and into our hearts. Who is your Nineveh? Let me put up some ideas that it could be. You know, your Nineveh is all around you. It's the neighbor who makes too much noise and bugs you. It's that classmate or colleague who sometimes drives you crazy. It's the person who is Jewish, or Muslim, or Hindu, or atheist, or agnostic, or just indifferent, or any other religion. It's your boss with whom you don't always see eye to eye. It's anyone you meet who doesn't yet know Jesus and the salvation he provides. It's the people that, you, that make you uncomfortable. Now, I just put a list of a few things here. Um, Six things or so. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. We could make the list even longer, couldn't we? But I think the point is this. Your Nineveh are really the people that don't yet know Jesus and that are often different from you and that maybe are a challenge to love or maybe the people that you don't care much about on one level, but God does. That's the point. God cares about them, and God's saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying, will you care about them too? Will you love them too? They're like, they don't know good from evil. They need, your, they need teaching. They need to hear about Jesus Christ and the way of salvation. The people of Nineveh needed Jonah to go to them to preach this message of salvation, right? And so I would say that, that the application for us is that God wants to send you and me to our Nineveh. Those people that need Jesus. You might be afraid to go there. You might be, uh, God wants you there. You might be afraid to speak up in a class. But, but God, there, there are people that need to hear what God wants you to say. People of Nineveh need you. They need your love. They need your witness for Christ. They need you to invite them to church. They need a friend. And so, will you love your Nineveh? Will you love your Nineveh? That's the question that God was asking Jonah. Will you love Nineveh? Because I do. Jonah's Nineveh was ready. And here's the thing. Jonah's, Jonah's Nineveh was ready to turn the Lord in repentance and salvation before he got there. God had prepared hearts. God had worked and God had prepared things. God had orchestrated everything and he just needed somebody to go. Sometimes that's all God needs. God's gotten hearts ready. God's working in amazing ways. 
God's calling you to your Nineveh and to give them the message. And what's the message to give to Nineveh? Well, it's the message, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the message to your Nineveh. That's the message to my Nineveh. You see, the story of Jonah, of course, took place before, before the coming of Christ. If you just chronologically, we, should, we know that. But now that Jesus has come and lived and died on the cross and risen from the dead, here's the great thing. We know that it's through faith in him that we are saved. You see, when Jonah cried out in Jonah chapter 2, he said, salvation comes from the Lord. He had this revelation, if you like. And but here's the thing, you and I know that in, in, in a deeper way than even Jonah could have known that. We know how salvation comes from the Lord. It was through Jesus and his death and his resurrection that we can be saved. And so, salvation comes from the Lord. We can say that in a way that even Jonah couldn't say that. And Jesus said, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish, so the Son of Man was three days and three nights in the earth. In other words, the, the timeline of Jonah is equivalent to the timeline of Jesus in the ground as he died and then leading to his resurrection. And so the one points to the other. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus, by the way. Did you know that? All the stories, I mean, I mean not, I'm not saying every single uh, little uh, verse, and, and no, but as a whole, when you look at the big picture, even in every single book of the Bible, there's something in it Something in each book of the Old Testament that points to Jesus. Some character that is Christ-like. Some person who is a type of Christ. Some situation like the Passover lamb that shows us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, and that points to Christ, our Passover lamb. There's something in each book of the Bible that is pointing us to Jesus. And we see that in Jonah. And so... Let's insert, now what I want to do here, I want to insert the name of your Nineveh in this verse, okay? So what I mean by that is, instead of saying, for God so loved the world, that's generic. By the way, it's talking about the people in the world, right? God so loved the people. What if we were to say, for God so loved your Nineveh? Right? Because they're in the world. They're just a, a, a subcategory, if you like. So God so loved your Nineveh that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, that if your Nineveh believes in him, they shall not perish, but have eternal and everlasting life. You see, though you think your Nineveh might be far from God, they might be a whole lot closer to salvation than you think. I think Jonah was... I don't just think. I know Jonah was, uh, he was, I think, he was shocked in some level at the response of Nineveh. He wasn't shocked at God's uh, grace, because he remember he said, I knew that you would show them grace. I think Jonah was shocked that Nineveh turned to the Lord. That's why he's having such a hard time in chapter 4. He can't grasp it. He can't get around it. He can't get over it because it's not exactly what he wanted. But you see, God was working on his heart. And the way that this story ends, it ends in a bit of a, a strange note, right? I mean, just look how it ends. Should I not be concerned about that great city, God says to Jonah? And we don't read what the response is of Jonah. It's like, I want to read more, you know? It's like it ends a, in like a book, you know, on a, a, a kind of a, is there part two coming, or what's going to happen? You know? I'm looking at my Bible here. There's got to be another, there's got to be continuation here. It can't end like this. What happened to Jonah? What did, what did Jonah do? Did he, did he come around, or did he stay uh, at an arm's length? We don't know. It's a bit like the story of the prodigal son, where the, the oldest son, who's, who's like Jonah in many ways, uh, he, he's been on the inside uh, in terms of the relationship with the father, but he's on the outside in terms of understanding God's grace, the father's love and heart. And, and when he sees the younger son, when he sees his brother return, he's all upset, he's all pouting, he's all uh, angry. And his, the father says, come on in. We should be happy this son of mine was lost and now he's found. Come and join the party. 
You can read that in Luke 15. And, and we're not told what he did. We're not told what the older son did. I think the Bible is quite intentional to end the story like this because I think we are to relate to Jonah on different levels. And I think just like God is saying, Jonah, get with it. Get with the program, Jonah. I love these people. You need to love them. I'm showed, I showed you grace. I'm showing them grace. You should be happy. Just like God is inviting Jonah, God invites us to love our Nineveh. God invites us to participate in what he's doing in this world. And we do that when we share the gospel. When we share the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation of all who believe, even your Nineveh. So may God help us individually to do this. May God help us as a church to do this, that we would see more people reached in this Verdun, in La Salle, in Montreal, that we would just be able to see God's kingdom grow and come. And he's going to use you. He's going to use you if you're willing. Just as Jonah he was inviting Jonah, hey, I want to keep using you, but you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we want to come before you and ask that we would just have eyes to see the things that we need to deal with, the things that we need to maybe confess to you and repent of and, or the things that we need to do or not do. Lord, I thank you that you are gracious. Throughout this whole story of Jonah, I mean, you are so gracious. So gracious to Jonah, so gracious to the people of Nineveh. And Lord, you are the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. And so thank you that we don't have to worry about what we read here Seeing you as gracious God, we don't have to worry that you're not suddenly that person anymore. You, you, you never change. And therefore, we can rely on your grace. We can depend upon it. But we can also share that grace with others. And so help us to do so. Help us to reflect on who our Nineveh might be and how you might want to use us to show your love to those group, to those people or that person. And thank you, Lord, that you don't give up on us. Just like you didn't give up on Jonah. You didn't quit. You kept pursuing him. You kept pursuing him. Thank you, God, that you've done that with us a thousand times over. But I pray, Lord, that we would respond in a positive way today. Just like Jonah had that opportunity to respond, and we don't know how he did, but we believe that you give us that same opportunity and so help us today to respond to you with an attitude of love, humility, trust, and dependence. And we ask this for your sake, in Jesus' name, amen. just invite you to say hello to the people around you. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. May God bless you, and uh, have a wonderful day.